Yep, all set. Yep. All righty. So welcome everyone. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day before this holiday weekend uh, to join our second part of our um, social justice forum, um, our quick action forums that we have been um, compelled to do much sooner than anticipated because of some of the recent uh, happenings in the United States. Um, uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Rob Delu. I'm the Director of Multicultural Affairs here at Bristol. Um, and Melissa is um, our, my activities coordinator um, and works for Multicultural Affairs. And we've been working diligently to try to put, um, put together some of these uh, forms that, and we have six of them that are, that are in play right now. And we're talking to a lot of the community members. Um, and this one was extremely important after our first one, which was the, uh, um, that we did about a month ago, um, which was, it, it was a powerful, powerful event. And we will uh, recap that in a second, but um, that event will, it was the, 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 the standard or the, the driveway for us to kind of really get uh, these things moving along. Um, over, um, over this time period, we, we're talking to business professionals, um, police sergeants, uh, community members, national agencies, national social justice institutes and agencies to really try to bring together um, these forms that are of taste and create um, solution. And that's what is different than this form because I've been in the last, I want to say, um, month, I've been to maybe almost close to 20 different forums just to see what is happening nationally. Um, a lot of the forums are discussions that are happening and they're very, very important. Um, what makes us unique and where we're starting to get a lot of national recognition is as we're sitting down with our, these professionals, whether they're educators, um, public servants, we're looking to find solutions that are going to create a better community and how to, and we can be the leader in doing that. Why not us, correct? So we're looking to really implement things and really get things moving to help our youth, to help our our people of color to help our police departments to help our educational for, uh, our educational institutes um, to get there. And today we'll have um, a broad range of individuals from the community. Um, there's a lot of so this is not just a Bristol Community College um, event. Um, we have a lot of people from Bristol County who um, may be affiliated with Bristol or may not who will be in in in, in the audience. We have individuals from other institutes across the nation that um, other EDU um, um, institutes that are, will be partaking and taking notes themselves. And then we also have, you know, many of our uh, brave men and women who are, are law enforcement agencies and that are, will be part of this today as well. And, and I'm excited to have them here as well as some of our, um, you know, our other agencies, which are, you know, work on the social, um, Social emotional components uh, and that are, that that we need in these um, at, that we need in these times. So, with that said, um, again, I like to kind of just recap part two here, and then so we can go to the next the slide, please, Melissa. So, our first social justice uh, event took place on June fourth, twenty twenty. We had about one hundred and sixty-two participants, which was a great uh, great for that um, great for that event today. We had about 143 people RSVP. Um, so hopefully we'll get up to that number, but we know how things happen. People may or may not get there. However, this is a recorded event. So we will, anyone who did register, will get a copy of today's event. Um, the form, um, the reason why we, we kind of jumped into this form ahead of time was because it, what triggered was the, the death of George Floyd, which was a, something that was caught on film that was pretty gross and it kind of will stick with a lot of people. Um, however, one thing that we did speak about in that last form, we understood that even though that it was a, an incident that is awful, we know that this is not something, and hope, this is not something that is normal to some, but is normal to a lot of others, okay? Um, and we did, we did speak to, you know, we did speak about this um, in, you know, in the last form, and we, that last form lasted about almost four hours. It went over. Today, we won't go over. Um, these, are, these are forms that, are, that we're making sure this, this, has an, this has an agenda that we will stick to, and we will kind of really, and we will end right when it's supposed to. Um, but if you do have any questions and things further, this is why this is created, so we can continue this conversation. 
Um, so in the last one, you know, our participants, they were able to share their personal experiences, comments and questions with the group. Um, it was powerful. Um, it was timely. It was fast. I think we were the one of the first in the country to put out a form like that. Um, and we did it really fast with the work of our campus, our president, Laura Douglas, who um, gave us the avenue and to do this. Um, our college communications department came together right away to make sure that we, were, we had the tools that we needed to get things on our website. Uh, we have a pledge that's out there that has over 700 people from the community to sign that race and discrimination and hate is just not, um, not uh, that those type of things, racism, I said race, but racism is not acceptable, right? These are things that we don't want and our college condemns that. We want to make sure that we have an environment that is safe and that is accepting to all of our students. And it's important that that messaging went out there and we were one of the first to do that. So kudos to our team at Bristol for making that happen. Next slide, please. So just a quick note, um, just so that we have an, an idea, okay? That all these trainings in the multi, uh, for Multicultural Affairs Social Justice Series are happening this summer and fall, and they are all introductory trainings. So what does that mean? Because they're introductory trainings, that these will be surface level trainings, and we're gonna get some more intent things later on for each one. So this is part two of the social justice series that we've rolled out, but this is part one of the criminal justice race and policing forum, all right? So there will be continuations of this as we move on semester to semester. Um, so we, I'm excited to announce that and we will continue working with many of our different um, police departments in doing this. And as our, other, as our other forms, we'll also work with professionals within each one of those subcategories. Um, additional uh, to uh, police criminal justice trainings will be offered that dive um, that will dive. So we're looking to dive deeper into policy, law, and specific topics. So please stay tuned for these as we move forward. Next slide, please. So today's agenda, what are we going over? So obviously I, I'm speaking right now. Um, as you can see, we have a, a, a panel of professionals. Um, we have the chief, and, uh, chief of police of Bristol Community College and deputy chief will speak. Chief of police from Fall River, the police department will speak. Um, uh, Demetrius uh, Phillips, who's a sergeant in Fitchburg Police Department, will speak. Justin Caverio, who is a director of Bristol Community College. Um, uh, Joseph Marshall, Veterans Center, will also speak. And Ken Kirby, director of practice and center for court innovation out of New York, will also speak in today's program. Um, that first hour or 50 minutes will be really dedicated to those individuals to speak without any, uh, any, any Q&A. After that, the questions and comments will come in, and we, we ask you to kind of reserve from the comment box until then. Even if you want to make a point, that's fine. You want to, that those are things that are maybe write it down and keep it, and then when we open questions and comments, then you can utilize the, the chat box and or send private message or whatever it is if you would like to speak, okay? Once I do that, I'll give you the floor. If you can, just reserve your time to pretty short. Uh, if you're asking a question, maybe about two minutes per person. Um, you can ask multiple questions, but I do ask for people not to dominate um, the microphone as we want to hear from many, many perspectives um, as, we, as we move along in this, okay? So, and then at the end, we'll go to next steps and closing remarks. So the next steps is you're going to see what we've built into this program today. You're gonna see from these professionals, they're going to do a lot of things there because I think transparency is key and something that we don't normally see a lot of, even though it's open, we don't really get that communication sometimes from, from other professional entities around the country and police departments in the community sometimes, even though there's supposed to be a greater synergy between the, the community and the police departments, you don't necessarily see um, things that are out there that can be proactive, right? And we wanna be proactive in our, we wanna be proactive in this, um, in this fight to creating social change. So today you'll see from our, from our presenters, they are going to speak about their experiences and why they are doing what they are doing. But they're gonna talk about what's happened in the past or what they've done in the past, because sometimes the community may not know this. Then they will speak about what they're currently doing. And then last, they will talk about what they plan on doing in the future. And what's great about this, I sat down and met with them uh, um, a couple times over the last few months, uh, a few weeks, I'm sorry. 
and that was the things that we talked about is like where can we go and how can we be transparent so the general public can see what you're doing in your field and how can that be innovative in order to create social real social change for not only people on our campus but people within our bristol county uh, community and then for also people who may be chiming in from areas that are outside of our local circle that may be able to influence change there and then how did that compel me what it what compelled me to do this is remember in our last forum i did mention that we need to create social change and we need to influence our circle of influence whether big or small how do we do that to create it we're not going to just talk and complain about the things that are happening because the things that are happening have been happening for a long time so let's get ourselves to a place where we're creating the social change and we're making things happen and these fine um these fine gentlemen that are going to be speaking today once i brought this up to them every single one of them jumped on board and was excited to do this and i think this is the norm there's more people that want to help than there are people that do not so but we have to create a space and how i'm influencing my area is i can create these type of spaces these type of forms so you can hear from these great individuals that will start talking about change and making our world a better place next slide please so let's begin in a second melissa is going to go over a couple of the research and why are we here and what is the point of having the a policing race and criminal justice forums go ahead melissa hi everyone so like rob said um, i'm just here to frame today's forum um, so we've pulled up some statistics that show the intersection of race and policing and why we're here today um, so as you can see more than eight in ten black adults um, say that blacks are treated less fairly than whites by police in the criminal justice system as a whole. Additionally, um, Black and African Americans believe that they are half as likely as whites to have a positive view of police treatment of racial and ethnic groups or officers' use of force. And when speaking about police officers, most white Latino officers say that fatal encounters between Blacks and African Americans in police are isolated incidents whereas the majority of black officers disagree with this notion. Um, and these are just like Rob and I had said, um, just to frame the discussion and to show why we are having this today and why we need to have conversations like this. So thank you, Melissa. So when looking at social justice um, uh, forums like this, the one thing that we want to keep in mind that it, you know, we may, Right now, we're, we're looking at race relations. It's a lot bigger because systemic racism and all the different things that we're talking about, um, different ways of policing, these things are, are you know, how are, um, you know, how are, if people are able to access help if there are, you know, there's mental issue, mental health issues. These are things that are important and we wanna kind of frame that as well in, in this conversation. And we may go into that, um, into those areas. And we have people like Kenton who are certified that can really speak to that and some stuff that they've done for those communities as well. So we wanted to make sure we covered that um, in, in doing this. So, um, so let's begin, let's move forward. So I wanna talk about Bristol Community College Police um, um, Department. Um, I would talk from my lens and from my experience. Um, the police department here at Bristol has been nothing but collaborative with me and my department. Um, my department, we, I work with students of color um, with, that, with various identities, come from various um, neighborhoods like in Providence and New Bedford and Fall River, Taunton. Um, some of them have grown up in some tough situations. And there's been situations that have happened on campus um, but the transparency was there. I was contacted if a student was in trouble or needed some, or was in need. Um, we did collaborations where some, where um, when I used to coach men's basketball, we had a talk with, you know, I had a student that did something that they weren't supposed to do. And it wasn't just a persecution of that student. It was like, how can we get to a, a place where we're all getting along better? These are all things that taken place way prior to any incident or these type of forms, okay? And then today, um, we're gonna have two of, their, of the leaders from um, New Bedford Police, to, I mean, New Bedford, I'm so sorry, from um, Bristol Police to speak. Um, and then we'll you know, kind of go from there. Next slide, please. So first, um, 
uh, our first is our chief police of Bristol Community College is Mark Natalie. And, uh, and Chief Natalie is uh, married for 14 years, five children, um, he's a lifelong Bristol County resident, born in Fall River. Uh, favorite activities and hobbies are sports, uh, sports, motorcycle, riding, um, movies, and music. Proud graduate of Bristol Community College. Um, he's a Northeastern graduate as well, and, and also a graduate of Salve Regina University. Um, and then he's been a police officer since 1995, and he's been a Br Bristol's chief since 2018. Next is uh, Baxter Smith, and he's the uh, deputy chief police. Um, he's a deputy deputy chief of police at Bristol uh, Community College, and as so, Baxter has been with the um, Bristol for six years, and he's began uh, working with campus police department as a patrol officer, and was promoted to sergeant, and was recently promoted to deputy chief. Baxter earned his bachelor's and master's degree in criminal justice from Sacred Heart University in Connecticut. Um, Outside of police work, Baxter owns his own and operates his own small landscaping business, enjoys spending time with his family and friends. He enjoys being outdoors. Um, Baxter loves his job as a campus police officer because he enjoys interactions with students, staff, and visitors. And he believes that working with, um, with the community is the best way to make Bristol a safe, um, Bristol a safe place to learn and work. So, Welcome, and um, Chief Natalie and Chief um, Deputy Chief Smith, um, and the show is yours now. All right, great. Uh, if we could put the slideshow up, please, Melissa. Thank you so much. Uh, so I just um, would like to start with um, speaking about what we have uh, done here. Um, here, um, um, here at the college, we focus on uh, community policing. Um, and with that being said, that means that we are um, uh, wa uh, wa uh, walking around on the campus and trying to stress our interactions with uh, with uh, student staff and and. Uh, uh, Community members. Um, uh, when you create those re uh, relationships, uh, trust is uh, trust is trust is uh, built, and that um, helps. W uh, when officers are 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 dealing with a situation uh, that staff or student uh, may feel uh, uh, more comfortable um, with that officer because of a past uh, positive experience from. Uh, Community policing. Um, we also uh, listed a, 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 a few events that we have done uh, in the past um, with the Uh, with the community, um, we would like to continue these and work it, uh, work in collaboration with all campus partners to um, get creative and uh, build on these. Next slide.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, as Baxter said, we, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we prioritize um, intimate contact with the community. Uh, familiarity breeds trust. Uh, th that's no secret. Um, he went over some of the things that we have done. Um, I'll just touch upon some of the things we are doing uh, and then um, we'll move on to things that we have uh, um, on the schedule, if you will, what we're gonna do in the future. Um, we, uh, not only do we continue to do what we have been doing by our community relations and uh, uh, working with uh, really every aspect of the, of the community, Always, we do our best to do so. Uh, also working with um, other police departments. Um, I have had a brief conversation with uh, Chief Cardoza in uh, Fall River. We haven't had time. Uh, the pandemic has thrown everyone's world upside down, so we have not had time to really meet and, and dive into things as uh, deeply as we'd like. Uh, we have met uh, with the Multicultural Affairs Office. Um, and again, Prior to the pandemic, we had plans to uh, to initiate some uh, trainings with that department and our department uh, to further benefit the uh, the community here. Um, we uh, other things we are doing. Obviously, we continue to take part in uh, activities such as the mobile food market, uh, things that benefit not only our community but also uh, show the outside community, if you will, um, the best uh, that Bristol has and what we and what we try to do to help. Um, we, um, again, we are taking part in uh, online trainings uh, for the most part right now, because uh, quite frankly, that's all that's available to us during the uh, coronavirus era. Um, a large part of those trainings are diversity awareness, uh, some um, uh, racial relation uh, awareness trainings and um, things of this nature. This forum is a, a big, uh, big part of our education as well as the education, hopefully the education of, uh, of our entire community. I've taken part in, in similar forums throughout my career and I've seen firsthand the benefits uh, that come from open and honest communication. Uh, it, it's unbelievable, and I I have no doubt that we're going to uh, we're going to improve upon our uh, our standing practices now. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Next slide, please. All right, um, and here are just some points um, that we are planning to do. Um, we are always uh, striving to build on the. Uh, the uh, relationships that we have already developed by um, taking part in, in these uh, social justice uh, forums, uh, uh, meeting with uh, 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 the third departments and clubs and uh, student unions um, uh, because that is how um, we will learn um, how we can do better and how um, and how we can become more ingrained um, with our staff and our students. Um, we are also looking to uh, create a social media um, to, sh um, um, to showcase um, all of the events that we have done and that uh, we will be Doing. Um, we are also looking to uh, create more ways to uh, uh, recruit a, a more diverse uh, pool of candidates 
for our officers here at the college. Um, and at the end of this, we want you guys to help us tell us what we can do to be b uh, better because that's why we are here. We're here to serve the college and that's why we all work here. Uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Am I unmuted? Good. So thank you guys um, for, for that. And we will you know, have a lot of time after to ask questions um, to both um, uh, Baxter Smith and to Chief Natalie as well. Um, so if we can go on to the next slide, please, Melissa. So our next guest um, is uh, Chief of Police of Fall River Police Department is uh, Jeffrey Cardoza. Um, Chief Cardoza has been with the been policing for over 30 years. He has a public uh, he has a master's in public administration. He's a graduate um, of the FBI National Academy. He's a graduate um, senior management. He's a graduate of the Senior Management Institute for Police, also a graduate for the Law Enforcement Executive Development Program. A um, couple other things I'd like to add, just moving this thing here. Uh, City of Fall River Police Department, um, some of the things that, that we know of the department, they got 221 sworn officers, approximately 75,000 calls for service every year. Um, in 2019, there was uh, 2,520 uh, physical arrests in Fall River, and in 2019, uh, 2019 as well, there were 125 uh, use of force reports completed, and Chief could probably, will explain that a little bit more um, moving forward. So uh, I would like to welcome uh, Chief of Police of Fall River Police, uh, Jeffrey Cardoza. Chief, you're on mute. <laughs> Still on mute. There you go. Rob, can you hear me now? Can you hear me, Rob? Okay, yes, hang on. I can't hear you. Can yeah, you hear me? Hear you. We can hear you Okay. Now. My, my apologies. I don't know. I'm not a very tech-savvy guy, so my apologies, Rob. But thank you for um, giving me this opportunity to um, – present and talk and answer some questions at this very important program. And I just want to say before I get into the, the next slide that, um, you know, it's a, uh, I want to echo what Chief Natalie said that I also believe that communication and getting people in the same room and forums like this is what's the big thing that's going to solve a lot of these issues. So Melissa, could you put up the first slide for me, please? Rob, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can't. I, I'm on mute. So yeah, we can definitely hear you. So okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I just, I just want to get into uh, talk a little bit about, you know, some of the good things that we've had as far as, you know, in the past and, and, and the present. And I think it's important that we mention uh, being CALEA certified. We've had that distinction since since 2009. And uh, CALEA stands for the um, the Committee on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, and it's a uh, na nationally recognized uh, process that requires an agency to follow the best practices. Um, we're one in 600 that are certified in the country, and there's 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States, so that's important to mention. The next bullet, um, I mentioned that we're also state certified. That's something that we, a lot of agencies first will get state certified, and then they'll move on to the, uh, the nationally certification, so we have that as well. Um, I feel comfortable saying that I don't believe there's any systemic, you know, racism in the, in the police department. I certainly have some concerns about implicit bias, but that's something I'll talk about a little bit later. We, um, we've, Rob and I have talked about this a couple of times. We, we've, we haven't been, um, we've been training officers at our yearly in-service training not to use chokeholds. They've been told not to do that, not to do any type of, um, you know, restriction on anyone's neck or in that area. Um, and we've also been talking about uh, intervention, that officers have an obligation to intervene if they see another officer doing something, whether it's verbal or it's physical, that's improper or it has a, uh, you, you know, a force issue to intervene and stop that from happening. 
We've always required written use of force reports whenever uh, an officer uses use of force. And we always follow the uh, Mass Police Training Council guidelines. Um, the use of force reports, they, when they, when a use of force report is completed, it, it goes through uh, a sergeant's hands, it goes through a lieutenant's hands, it goes to a captain's hands, it goes to a deputy chief's hands, and then ultimately it goes to me. And then from there it goes to what, what's called our Office of Professional Standards. Now I bring that up because I just want to stress that um, they are thoroughly vetted. Um, it's something that we take very serious. So also uh, complaints against officers or, or civilian staff in a building can be made in numerous ways. Um, you can, we've had people that call and they do it over the phone. You can do it in writing. You can do it via email. Um, and I just think it's important to have that because, um, you know, some people aren't comfortable actually coming in here and, and, and may not, may, you know, may not want to do that. or may want to meet someone from professional standards in another location. We certainly would be, um, okay with doing that. And then something since I became uh, chief a couple months ago, so I think it's important to mention is I've been stressing since day one, because I truly believe this in my heart, that we're guardians and we're not warriors. And I think we need to act that way and, you know, to instill that mindset in each officer in this building, whether it's the, the deputy chiefs under me or it's the most junior officer, we're guardians, not warriors. So they've been hearing, I think they're probably sick of hearing it from me, but they've been hearing that from me uh, every day since I, I was able to become chief. Could I have the next slide, Melissa? So some of the things that we're doing now uh, that I think are some pretty good stuff, um, I, I talked about how we, you know, we train not to use choke calls. Well, we're actually going to put it in, we're in the process right now of, of putting it in our use of force report. So I'm sorry, our use of force policy. Um, it will, it, it's going to specifically say that choke holes and any type of pressure on the neck is, is banned. We're also going to put in writing that we require intervention by any officer at the scene. And if it's determination is made that an officer did not intervene, um, doesn't have to be the officer necessarily that's involved in, in, in the incident. It could be a backup officer just pulling up on the scene. It could be a supervisor. It could be me. If we fail to, uh, to intervene, and, uh, then we're going to be held accountable for that and be disciplined. Where um, we had some language in our policy about not shooting it at, at moving cars, but we're going to tighten it up where we're going to completely ban it unless a firearm is being shot from the vehicle. I certainly hope that doesn't happen, but... Um, we have a little caveat to that. So, and then uh, we're adding in providing a verbal warning if feasible during a lethal force incident. There are some circumstances where an officer might not be able to do that, but if they are to, we're certainly going to encourage them to do that. Um, and then we're going to um, something I'm pretty proud of, and, and Rob and I talked about this at length, and he actually was at the last forum. We um, we're going to be t participating in more forums with. We're, we're, what I call officer panels. We had a very diverse panel uh, last week, Rob, right? And um, we're going to, uh, a lot of people in the audience talked about wanting to have a, a be able to ask questions of a, uh, a panel that has uh, mostly white officers. So we're gonna, we're gonna do that. I'm gonna uh, put together a group that has uh, some officers who are uh, young, new, fairly new to the job. And then I'm gonna put, to, and I also have some officers who have been on the job for a while. Just to, just to move on now, some of my concerns, some of the things that I want to move forward to that I think are important for not only the organization here, but um, for the community and for building these relationships and these rapports so we can move on from this. Um, I want to uh, address and accept that there's probably some implicit bias in the organization. We're going to have some training with that, reaching out to different people to do that. Uh, the big thing that I'm concerned about is diversity. I recognize that we don't have enough diversity in the building and we're going to put together a, um, a recruitment team that I hope to be able to have go to the local high schools, uh, go to Bristol Community College, go to UMass Dartmouth, go to Roger Williams and walk some of the kids uh, through what our organization is all about, um, our professionalism, um, the good stuff, but also be able to have take questions and talk about some of the bad stuff that comes with policing. And the, one of the key components to this is getting some feedback at some of the, the demonstrations and talking to some of the kids who may or may not be interested, kind of on the fence, whether they would want to come into a, a career like this, is how, to, how does the process work? How do they get chosen? And a lot of the kids didn't know, you know, the, the young adults didn't know that, you know, we're a civil service organization. Um, it's not just a 
white chief deciding if he's going to take a black officer. It's, 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 of course I would if the person was qualified, but there's, there's a, a, an examination and there is a, a list and we draw off that list and it, there's not a lot of um, room for deviation from that. So I think it's important that the kids hear that exactly how to go, go through that process. Um, improving communication with the public. We're doing it now. Um, we're going to continue to do it. I'm going to participate in every forum that I can. We're going to have more panels. The mayor and I have uh, uh, got one coming at the end of the month, and I'm certainly looking forward to that. Comprehensive de-escalation training. Um, and it, we do do some de-escalation training, but this is something that I had the opportunity to learn a lot about. There are departments around the country and uh, around the world, quite frankly, that are doing it better than I think we're doing it here. Uh, you know, there's, there's more emphasis on um, a tactical retreat, if you will, or uh, stepping back for a moment, slowing down the process as to what's going on, and using your communication skills uh, if, it's, if it's at all feasible. So that's something that, that I want to work on. Transparency. Uh, we, we've talked about this uh, at the panels. I'm going to continue to talk about it. If we make a mistake, my philosophy is to say that we made a mistake. Um, we're going to stop putting our, uh, some of our policies on the website so people can, can see what that's all about. And then uh, one of the big changes that's coming up, and it's something that Mayor Coogan um, has been working towards, and is a, creating a body-worn camera pilot program. So we're not going to go into this too fast where we're going to overnight have the officers um, every officer in the building start carrying carrying a camera because there are are, are uh, two party consent issues with recording in the, in the state and there are privacy issues so we're putting together a policy with a panel that will involve um, you know various segments of of the community and uh, we're going to come up with a, a policy that's going to work and we're going to start having some of the officers here um, wear those body cameras and um, hopefully in the near future we'll be able to to outfit each and every officer with one of those. The simulator. We, we years ago, we had a simulator um, where that puts people through, if you're not familiar with it, um, scenarios that you don't know um, are coming. So, you, you, you know, an officer or it could be anyone from the community is provided a, a gun belt, uh, a, a, a mock firearm, and um, it may just be a scenario with someone who's having a, 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 some type of a emotional issue, or it could be a scenario where someone's stepping out of the car and and, and you got to use deadly force, God forbid, but, um, you know, no officer wants to do that. But we're going to bring the simulator back, um, and we're in the process right now of, of having that, that uh, particular software updated. And, and um, my thoughts are, once we get there, um, to start putting some, of, uh, some people in the, in the public or, you know, in, in, in education or whatever it may be, maybe Rob would go through, uh, some people you recommend, and just get a sense of, 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 you know, the, uh, the stress that comes with, uh, comes along with simulation training. So a couple of things I wanted to mention that might not be specific to, you know, our topic, but I think still think they're important is that I'm working on trying to have a full-time recovery coach actually embedded in the police department. I'm uh, really looking forward to this. We're, we're in the process of trying to secure some of the funding and that person will be uh, act, actually have an office in here in the building and work. Um, work some nights, work some days, and work with the officers, go on the street and deal with some some, uh, some addiction issues, if you will, and, and get referrals from the officers. So we're looking forward to that. And then the, the next project on my, uh, on my agenda would be to try to get some of um, a social worker. We respond to about uh, 1,200 mental health calls a year. Um, I think it's an important issue, and I think the reason I bring it up today is that sometimes uh, officers get involved in use of force incidents with someone who may be having a mental health issue and we don't need to do that. So we need to get some training. We need to get some people in here that can help us with that. We're going to attach our, as I mentioned earlier, our uh, uh, use of force and our racial profiling policy to our website. Um, we're uh, going to improve how to make a complaint uh, against an officer or a civilian. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the recruitment unit and um, Rob and I talked about this uh, the other day, and I'm hoping I, I, I got his full support on it. But uh, we, I'd love to see the creation of a police academy. I know it's been talked about at the, the, uh, the administration at the, uh, the college has some interest in that. And I just think it's a great way to um, get everybody involved with working with those 
uh, future police officers for 22 weeks and molding them and, and, and creating that guardian, um, that guardian versus warrior mindset. So, Melissa, could you go to the next slide? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's all I had from you. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I just I didn't know if you and I'll, I'll certainly talk about it if if I if you don't mind. Um, I just want to mention the the um, the the governor. Uh, I, I know a lot of people have been asking me questions over the last few weeks as to you know where is this going to go as far as law goes and and um, I've only seen some some material related to uh, uh, proposed uh, laws in the state that may come up. And I, and I think it's just important to, uh, to mention that the, the certification process, I think as, as I'm reading it is extremely um, uh, strict. Uh, if it, if it's, uh, uh, if it's passed, if though, if that's the direction that it goes in, I think it's going to have a significant impact, if you will, on, on uh, officer conduct. So thank you. Thank you, uh, chief. I really appreciate it. Um, over the last uh, couple of weeks, I've uh, attended a few things with the mayor, and, and one of them was the police panel. And um, hearing, the, um, hearing the honesty from some of the police officers was a great thing. Um, and I think it's, a, it's really kind of um, framing, you know, how positive this the police department and this chief is moving forward. So uh, thank you, chief, for doing that. And there will be some opportunities for questions um, a little later on. Uh, moving to the next uh, to the next piece, and uh, for the next couple of speakers, will, are are a little different. There's a little crossover in education. Um, there's a crossover in education and policing and military and so on and so forth. So we would like um, for the next um, person will be Demetrius Phillips, who um, is also a friend of mine, um, and is um, Demetrius is also municipal municipal police uh, sergeant and adjunct business faculty member at Bristol Community College. I got to stop speaking so fast. Uh, Demetrius is um, again currently with the um, police department in Fitchburg, and he's an um, and he's also an adjunct business faculty member at Bristol Community College. Uh, Demetrius holds a bachelor in science at criminal justice, a master's in administration with a concentration in management, and is currently uh, completing his doctor of business administration dissertation. Demetrius has 15 years of experience in policing and has worked as a university police officer and is currently a municipal police sergeant. Additionally, Demetrius has five years of full-time experience of having uh, been an assistant professor in the business administration department here at Bristol Community College until this past spring. Uh, Demetrius is a family man and enjoys spending time with his, his wife and four children. Demetrius seeks to serve and help others as his mentors has helped him. So the floor is yours, Demetrius. Are you hey, everybody hear me okay? Yes. Welcome, yes. everybody. Uh, Rob, you make me sound really special in that introduction, so I, uh, <laughs> I, <clears throat> I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is speak from a personal level. I can't speak from the department level because that's not, you know, that's not where I am. That's not my position. As a police sergeant, I'm uh, middle line management. So I want to speak more about who I am and, you know, why I joined this panel. Um, I think this panel is incredibly important, right? And I, I, I like to preference this that, um, yes, I am a police officer and I love being a police officer, right? But I'm also an African American male. And there's two sides to that. And I think oftentimes what has to happen for minority officers inside police departments is for uh, chiefs or whoever are in command of police department is allow an opportunity for a space for minority officers to really talk about their experience, right? Because I feel like when I'm working um, in uniform, I'm being perceived as one way, but when I take my uniform off, there's some things that I have encountered that didn't go the way that I thought it should have went. And I think race was a factor in the reason why it did it. Um, I like to say that for the most part, all people are good, right? You know, there's a select few number of, of officers and police departments and society in general who do bad things. But that's just a small number of, of people who are doing these things. But I also think about uh, what's more important is for um, police chiefs to create this forum for minority officers to get together and talk about their experiences because it's all about what I think about perspectives, right? I created this class for Hannah Rand Consulting. His name is Justin Hannah Rand, again, Hannah Rand Consulting. I created a class for him and he trains police officers uh, to get promoted. And I created a class for him 
And the class is essentially called uh, Understanding Cultural Norms. And we really go into understanding different people's perspectives. Because, again, I think once you sit down with people, you understand who they are. Maybe you're, you're less apt to, um, to either judge them or to do something wrong against them because you understand who they are. So I think the biggest thing is understanding people's perspectives. And this is why I think this form that we're doing here is awesome because we're, we're doing exactly that, understanding different people's perspective. Um, I'm gonna, I want to add more, but I want to add it maybe more at the end. Um, so again, I want to speak more from a personal level. So Rob, that's all I got for me right now. Thank you so much, Demetrius. Um, next um, on the agenda is Justin Caverio. Yes, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. All right. I have, you want me to go over your bio? I know you're ready to go. Uh, you, don't, you don't need to. I'll, I'll do the intro. It's, it's, <laughs> all right. The bio is up if everybody wants to read it, and we'll get to Justin. We are a couple minutes behind, so that probably will help us with some of the time. Right, right. Um, so um, Justin Caverio, director at the, uh, the Bristol Community College uh, Veterans Center um, here at the Fall River campus. Um, 21 years um, active duty military, um, U.S. Marine Corps, four years, and the rest are uh, Massachusetts Army National Guard. Uh, three deployments, um, happy to be retired, January 2020, uh, retired for good. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you this, my perspective, and, 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 and I'll also um, start this with letting you know that I don't represent the view of all veterans. Um, I'm not big on boxes, um, so I can tell you my perspective as a veteran, and I think I'm more than qualified to, to share that with my time. Um, in service. Um, so, you know, what happened uh, in Minneapolis, uh, George Floyd, there's, there's really no debate. It was wrong. Anyone that's seen the video, I don't know really anyone that I've talked to that, that, uh, that could debate that it was right or wrong. So um, that being said, um, the current administration came on television, um, and this is where I, where I share my view as a veteran came on television and, and announced that if the governors in different states didn't uh, you know, do what they were supposed to do, basically if they couldn't handle it, um, he was going to you know, intervene and, and get the military involved, okay? And, um, and, and, I, and I gotta tell you, when I saw that and the way that it was uh, delivered, because you know, delivery means a lot, right? Um, it was just, uh, it, everyone I know that, that is a veteran like me that I've talked to um, just winced at that and, and, and just, you know, just looked and was like, what, what, what is this? And, and, and why would you, why would you present it in this way? Um, it, it was, I, I guess you could say uncomfortable to say the least. And um, yeah, I, I disagree with it, uh, you know, whole, wholeheartedly. Um, and then you have, that's why you have top generals that also disagreed with it and came right out and spoke against against uh, against that. You don't plot your own people against your own people. Um, most uh, national guard members, um, you know, I can speak, you know, you know, uh, pretty it's, it's pretty close to home for me. National guard, you know, I, I served in there from 2001 to to, to 2020 to present day, um, and um, you know, most national guardsmen uh, join that uh, particular organization to, to defend our home, um, to, to help people, you know, in times of snowstorms and blizzards and hurricane. Um, hurricane Michael, I went down there during, you know, down to Alabama and Florida um, in 2018. So these are the guys that are getting called up to, to for COVID-19. You know, we have, we have approximately a little over 30 students at Bristol that are National Guard members um, that, that are, are, you know, we call them weekend warriors, but, but when it comes down to it, a good number of them got called to active duty, to state active duty by the governor to handle this COVID-19 pandemic and, and to, to be at the test sites. Um, you know, Gillette Stadium was a big one um, and then all over. And, and, and these guys are leaving their families um, to, to actually um, you know, 
be there for 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 our citizens. So so these are the guys that are are actually um, standing up and 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 helping us um, to put their to put their lives and their safety on the line like that, and to utilize them as, as to weaponize them is is just wrong. Um, if you could hang on one second for me. I came unplugged. I don't want to lose. Uh, I don't want to lose power here. Um, yeah. So, um, so our own students, um, National Guards members, National Guard members, um, and, and they're the ones being called up. And and you, you know everybody knows somebody, if not a, an immediate family member, but everyone knows somebody that uh, that that is in the National Guard or is reserves or was in the military, an uncle even if it's not uh, immediate family, or, hey, if you know me or someone else, then you know somebody that, that was in it. And, and most of these people are good people. Uh, you know, I echo uh, everything that Demetrius said earlier, um, some great points. Um, you know, so that's, that's my perspective. Um, I did this because I wanted to, to, to support and help people. Um, that's why I did my time in there. I mean, we have a common struggle, you know. I, I have kids, I have sons that that I want to see safe, and 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 nobody likes what's going on. Um, there's really no debate. It's it's a right or wrong. Um, and anyone that that doesn't think that, I I'd have to disagree with with them. Um, I was talking to one of my closest friends um, a little over a week ago, and I'm um, saying now now my friend Brian, he's uh, he's from Trinidad. A little over, I think, 20 years in, in the Boston Police Department. We deployed three times together, um, you know, to various places in the world. And uh, I said, uh, I said, yeah, what's going on in Boston? Are they, you know, they throwing stuff at you guys? I know you're, you know, you work in the protest details. And he says, yeah, um, yeah, a little bit, you know, the other night, not too bad last night. Um, you know, I'm hoping to get up, you know, get off tomorrow so I can, you know, go downtown as a protest I want to do, go down there and do my civic duty. Um, and be a part of that. So, so here you have, you know, different people are in are in different roles, um, and and it's it's so true. But um, it's it's a common struggle, and it's and it's really a common sense thing, you know. It it really is, and um, you know, I think that uh, yeah, we just have to be there for for each other and uh, and support one another. And if it if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. Um, that's my uh, that's my quick two cents on that. As uh, you know, from my lens, my perspective. Um, happy to answer any questions afterwards and, and give you more um, of what I think in my point of view, you know. Thank you, Justin. I, I appreciate Thank that. Um, it's very, very important to get these perspectives. If you guys are looking, uh, audience looking how we're connecting, uh, we're going from, you know, the, the police component of, of how policing and race relations are built. Um, and so we've, we, we've got it from, you know, high ranking um, police chiefs and, and, um, and officers. And then we look from the black male perspective of being a police officer and, and navigating through this as well. And then we have the military component and education component of Demetrius and also, um, and also Justin here. And then that kind of really ties in. So as we are educators that are built into this, we are looking at different ways that we can impact change and, and develop things that can help us, um, especially when speaking with our students, okay? A lot of times uh, over the last, I just did a couple of trainings uh, one training I did last week, we, um, we, you know, we were little, you know, we feel like we're walking on eggshells sometimes and how can we do that? Well, these are components that hopefully will get us to a, a space where we're able to have uh, conversations that are a little bit more comfortable for us. And hopefully we're able to answer some of those questions today. Um, so I'm excited about our next guest. Is our special guest from uh, the city of New York and it's Kent and Kirby. Um, and he is a LCSW uh, completed master's degree in social work from New York University in 2011. Um, also nearly 15 years of experience in the field. Um, uh, Mr. Kirby previously worked as foster care and child uh, welfare with ACS Administration for Children, uh, Children's Services, as well as forensic social uh, worker throughout the New York State court system. Mr. Kirby um, has worked as an adjunct lecturer uh, with Long Island U, uh, University and Brooklyn College and, and has a wide array of experience providing individual and group therapy uh, to those with complex mental health needs 
um, in sex offender parenting and drug treatment program. Currently, Mr. Kirby is the director of practice at the Center for Court Innovation. The Center for Court Innovation seeks to create a more fair, effective, and humane justice system. In his previous role as director of uh, clinical and trauma support services at Neighbors um, in Action, an operating um, project um, of the center, uh, Mr. Kirby was one of the founders in developing and the implementation of Make It Happen program. Um, funded through the OVC, which is the Office of Victims of Crime, um, Make It Happen is a revolutionary and nationally recognized program model which provides mentorship, intensive case management, clinical um, interventions, and supportive workshops to young men of color ages 16 to 24 who have been impacted by violence. Through a trauma-informed and culturally uh, competent approach, participants are challenged to think about how their definition of manhood is intertwined in trauma and the implications and the implication it has on stereotypical gender roles. Mr. Kirby has presented at a number of local and national, local, national, and international conferences on success of, of Make It Happen program. Um, Make It Happen program's approach to trauma, healing, and advocacy for victims. Through um, an expansion, through expansion and pilots, Make It Happen is now participating in a number of interagency collaborations to integrate this model into other parts of New York City and across the country utilizing the program's trauma toolkit, which you got, the link is there. Kenton is awarded the Emerging Leader Award and um, National Association of Social Workers in New York City's chapter um, and was the Community Impact Award by Urban Justice Center in 2017. Most recently, Kenton was awarded the 2019 Advocate of New York City Award for the Mayor's Office to end domestic and gender-based violence. So I would like to welcome a good friend of mine, uh, Kenton Kirby. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you for that, Rob. Uh, Rob forgot to mention that I, I was one of his teammates. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he definitely shared with one of the few guys that would give me the ball. So I appreciate you, Rob. Um, so uh, I want to say thank you guys so much for having me uh, be a part of this really, really important conversation. Um, and a number of things like resonated with me uh, from some of you guys were talking about, um, from really about we're here to listen. Uh, I forgot some one of the one of the uh, officers mentioned uh, we're trying to be guardians and not warriors. These are things that are really resonating with me um, because in my role where I've been working at for the number of years for the past couple of years, we've been looking at violence and healing and everything like that from a preventive lens. Uh, so. I want to talk about, so when I worked at our project, Neighbors in Action, I was mentioned in the bio, I was running the Make It Happen program. But the Neighbors in Action project was one of our projects that wasn't court connected. All of our other projects at the Center for Court Innovation are all kind of tethered in, within the court system. This project was one of our only ones that was community-based. And we were housed in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. And we actually opened up a few years after the three days of unrest or riots, whatever folks want to use, um, in Crown Heights after the, uh, the death of uh, Gavin Cato, a little 11-year-old boy who was killed. Um, and it led to three days riots between the two communities, which is the Afro-Caribbean community and the uh, Orthodox Jewish community in that neighborhood, in that community. Um, so we thought we we're going to move, move into that neighborhood and just kind of do disaster relief, kind of get in there and kind of support, like kind of mediate conflicts between the both sides of the community. And um, we started noticing that it wasn't that. There were other things that were coming up. School social workers walking to our doors and say, we're having issues with some of the, the young people here. We need a program. We don't have the resources. Uh, so then we would do a rites of passage program for the young, for the young men in the schools. Um, we would have people come to our storefront and say, you know what, I'm having this conflict with uh, a neighbor over medical equipment that they're renting out. And um, it's actually a really funny story. This woman comes in, she's complaining about this community member that she rented a wheelchair out to, and she needed us to kind of mediate the conflict to get her money back. So we have her and the person that owes her money sit down together and we're talking through it and come to find out she was renting out this, he, he owed her three weeks of pay for the rental of the, uh, the, material, the, the wheelchair. It was six bucks. She was charging him $2 a week. And so we're like, well, we'll just pay you the six bucks. She goes, no, I want him to pay me. So we would have like 
mediations like the range from that to uh, sit, a woman coming to our office and saying that her son, she lost her son to gun violence and we don't, she's like, she doesn't know what to do. So um, with our, with our brain trust in, inside our project, uh, using uh, the Center of Court Innovation, that's our like arching agency doing the research, we actually found a model uh, called Cure Violence. I'm not sure if many of you guys are familiar with it, but it's actually a public health approach to looking at, to dealing with gun violence. It was developed in Chicago by an um, epidemiologist named Gary Slutkin. And so what you look at is, um, um, so you look at gun violence as a, a, a disease that can spread, right? So one shooting can lead to the next and lead to the next. And so what is the med what's the medicine for it? So for us, we hire folks from the community who have social currency, maybe at some point in their lives, they were the person that was causing a lot of the harm, but they have now turned their lives around. Maybe they've been caught in, they cycled through the system themselves um, by being incarcerated and now they're back home. And um, now their social currency plays has a little more weight when it comes to speaking to the young people who are currently involved in gun violence. Um, you know, so what happens, so I'm gonna to try to be as quick as possible. I wanna get folks to like the question and answer period, but, um, our, what we call them our credible messengers. When we first opened up in Crown Heights, Brooklyn in 2010, uh, the shootings in that catchment area went down 40%. And so um, the model worked. And so now um, we've expanded to uh, like 23 sites across New York City, all five boroughs, have some upstate New York. And it's really, it's a, it's a model that really works. And it's not necessarily working collectively with law enforcement. It's just like a how should I say this, we're going into the same room. We both want to have the same end result. We want to end the shootings and killings in the community, but we go in through a different door. And so our, our interaction with the local precincts is really more just like, okay, you see our team out there, they're wearing their jackets, their swag. They may be talking to someone that is, you know, that you may have your eyes on, but let them do what they're, let them do their job. But we're also not going to get in the way of your job either. Um, so well, for years we were doing this work. It was going, it was going well, the numbers were coming down. But what we noticed was, there were guys we take the guns out their hands, and then the guy's telling us, "I haven't slept. For, I haven't slept in three weeks. I've been drinking myself until I I pass out. So that's the only way I can get to sleep. I'm smoking excessively. So that's where we came in. We found some funding to uh, launch a therapeutic program for boys and men of color impacted by violence. And these are young folks that typically want to walk in through your your outpatient mental health clinic uh, because a lot of times historically because of systemic racism, because of the fact that any kind of help and support for black and brown bodies are usually tethered to some kind of punishment. Here's this help. If you don't take this help, here's the, here's the stick that's gonna come down on you if you don't take this help. So how do you build trust there? So we were a completely voluntary program working alongside this violence interrupted program, providing the mental health services, not necessarily coming to the clinic and sitting down with us. We were bringing intervention out to you, sitting down with our young people in a park, walking around a block with a guy and just having a conversation in their community, uh, trained clinicians actually doing this work. Um, and, and it really kind of shifted how mental health, we're really trying to shift what mental health work looks like. It doesn't have to be this um, ivory tower kind of approach. It can really be collaborative, right? And completely voluntary for our folks. And we've had quite a bit of success. And some of the things that would come up uh, for a lot of our young people was, yeah, the violence that they felt with the interpersonal violence within their communities and different light like, sets and cliques that they were having challenges with. But the, challenge, really, the stuff that really resonated with them was their police interactions. Um, the, like, they see they see an officer and they don't know whether or not that interaction is going to lead to them being stopped frisked and detained and then you know or it's going to be something that's the passing in passing kind of experience i mean i have tons of stories where i worked with a young man who was a victim of gun violence um and i'm treating him in his in his house he's had serious ptsd he's in his house can't even leave his home i'm doing it in his house every week with him and one day he's out in front of his block which is a heavily policed neighborhood because obviously there's some things, there's, you know, it's one of those heavily policed neighborhoods and cops hop out of a car and um, pull guns out on, on folks. And this is a kid who just had been shot a number of times and no one is considering the trauma response that this kid is having to it. So what does he do? He runs, right? Because last time he, last time he got shot, he didn't run. So it doesn't matter who was pulling the gun out on him. Was it? And if you think about uh, 
a learning brain versus a survivor brain, like a trauma brain. Trauma brain can't take in information. Trauma brain is just about trying to, trying to survive. So if I pull a gun out on you or some kind of weapon or whatever is pose a threat, I'm out. I'm going to do what I need to do to survive. So there's two, and, and, and you, you, I work with so many young folks that kind of had that balance where people were living with this trauma brain, but folks had this expectation that they had this learning brain where they can take in information. And I think that um, has been something that we've been working on with our young people, like kind of helping them understand, listen, this is a normal thing to have. <laughs> this trauma brain is a normal thing for you to have right now because of all the stuff you've been through. Let's start working on doing this. Let's start, let's start putting, let's start scaffolding things around you to help them do these things. Okay, how do you physically feel when a threat comes, when you assess a threat, right? Um, so this is stuff that we've been trying to do on our end with our young people, giving them this, like the resources that they can use internally, but understanding that I can't guarantee them full safety. I can tell a guy, you listen, when you walk down the street, a young black man with a hoodie, <laughs> people may perceive, make perceptions of you. I remember we, a couple of my guys in one group one day were like, you know, when you walk down the street, pull your pants up. Make sure you, uh, make sure you don't look a certain way. He was walking down the street, wearing bed stop broken, come to the group. He got stopped and frisked. He's freaking out on the phone, calling me after he got, after the experience. And he's like, Ken, I'm not coming to the group. I'm like, what happened? He goes, I got stopped. And he's like, they said it looked like I was sucking the gun. He's like, I pulled my pants up like you told me. And I think in that moment, I realized I can't guarantee you full safety. I can only give you the tools you need to kind of get as best, keep you as safe as possible. So that's in short what we've been doing here in Brooklyn with the violence prevention work and the therapeutic work kind of tethered with it. Um, and we're also doing, we also offer technical assistance nationally around various things through our court-based projects, our community-based work that we're doing. We're doing a lot of placemaking in the local um, public housing developments here in New York, like 15 of them. We're doing like uh, placemaking projects where we're like, doing cleanups in neighborhoods. Uh, we're doing, in one of the projects, in one of the housing projects, we're doing um, uh, coding. We're running coding classes for some of the kids. Um, so now we understand, like, now you have something that, like, coding is a big thing now, right? Everything is apps and technology. So we're trying to give our community members as many, many resources as possible, but at the same time understanding that there's an unsafe world out there. And for many of them, for many of our young people, the threat is, um, the law enforcement interactions that they have. They can navigate those conflicts that they have with uh, different, um, within the interpersonal, within different crews and sets and everything like that. But the one thing that's been, this is just their language. My biggest stressor is interaction with law enforcement. So I'll leave it at that. I know we're kind of behind schedule, so I'm gonna stop there. Actually, um, thank you so much, Ken. Um, could you explain real quick, just because um, I think with some of the law enforce, enforcement officers in this, um, the project that's happening out of Jersey that, that we spoke briefly about and some of the tactics that are used in order um, so maybe people can hear and impact their areas um, wherever they may be. Oh, the Camden, the Camden model of policing. Yes. I think uh, someone mentioned the Guardian, Not Warrior. Uh, um, honestly, I think I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, but one of the things I found really interesting was they, in Camden, New Jersey, the city of like, it's like nine miles long and it's not very big and there's like, um, what they were doing, they were taking uh, drug for money, money that they would get from like drug seizures and like bought ice cream trucks. And so they bought ice cream trucks and they would go, uh, the police would go to like areas that were hot, hot, labeled hotspots and just give out ice cream. So it wasn't even like they were like there, uh, they, were, they were in the area where things were happening, but they were, it was a reframing of kind of why we're here. You know we're here, but we're giving ice cream out. We're doing this other thing, but you know we're here. So like, it was real. I found that really, really interesting. Um, I know here in New York, we have our neighborhood uh, community officers that um, we work with really closely and we're trying to like, you know, bridge that gap between both sides. But we're also, um, as service providers, we have to be humble and say, it's gonna take a long time for us to rebuild that trust. Cause we did, we caused, we've caused so much harm. And I can say that as a licensed social worker, therapist, person that worked in child welfare, I can say I caused harm and I know I need to build, rebuild trust and it doesn't take three months of it. It takes years. It may, I, may not even, I may not even be in the work anymore uh, for, before we fully get to that place. So um, I think that's really, it's very important for us as providers to really just humble ourselves and say, historically, there's been a lot of stuff going on here. So, 
how do we, what do we need to do? And it's not always just saying, you tell us what we need to do. We cause a lot of this problem. So some of it needs to really fall on us to really be part of the solution. So, yeah, so thank you so much. I appreciate that. So my last message kind of, I was, one person was talking to me and I was answering that. And then, so if anyone has a question or a comment that they'd like to make, because we're moving into this part now, please feel free to do so. And, and if you just put in comment or you put in, um, you put in comment or you put in question, I will at, um, ask you to, um, to do that. And then I will call on you in order as it comes through. Some of you, if you also are not comfortable of asking a question, you want me to read, you can send me either a private message to ask the question, um, which will be confidential, or you can just write the question in and I can read it out for you as well. Um, I know some people are not as, as comfortable in doing this. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, again, I think uh, Kenton's part, um, part is very valuable of saying, like, these are some of the tactics of bridging these gaps that we talk about, right? So how do we bridge these race relations? Well, there's a lot of um, social workers and therapists and er that, do, that has this, does this work. Um, I do the work uh, as well within the centers that we have at Bristol and working with a lot of our populations. And I think these are all different little components that we can start developing uh, solutions as we move, um, as we move forward. Um, so uh, let's begin with the comments. Uh, Shanna Howell, actually uh, Michael Tarr, if you, uh, you have a comment. Yeah, hey, what's up, Coach? Hey, how's it going, Mike? I just had a quick comment um, for the chief of the Fall River Police Department, if I could. Back when he said that he doesn't believe that there's any systematic racism in the city, because I know, even though, you know, I happen to be a white male, I grew up in a very mixed family. So I've seen both sides of that. And I mean, I have some stories that I'm not going to share here because I, I discussed that I didn't really want to comment, but I just, I don't know. It's weird because to say none, but I've, I've seen it. <laughs> like I've seen it. I've like, yeah. Absolutely. So. No, thank you for that chief. Um, so actually what I, what I, I mentioned, I didn't mention the city as a whole. Um, I mentioned, that I didn't think we had a systemic problem in, in the FRPD. Um, I'm not going to suggest that issues haven't come up because they have. Um, I can tell you that um, I'm not aware of any um, significant issue in probably the last 25 years. Now, there may be something that I'm not aware of. I, I'm also a realist. And, and um, all I can tell you is what, what I have from my experience here in, in this organization. Um, but I, I strongly encourage everyone. I want to know, I need to know. And, and, uh, if something comes up, I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm here to listen. Um, I need to, if there's a problem in my organization, it needs to be, um, eradicated or weeded out if you will. So, um, I want to hold the offices accountable. And quite frankly, the feedback that I've gotten from the officers that work with me, um, they want to hold, um, you know, those who, who don't honor um, the oath that they took to the community, they want to hold them as accountable as well. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced it. Um, uh, I just haven't seen it, anything of a significant nature in our organization for probably about 25 years. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. You muted, Rob. Yeah, I am sorry. I clicked it twice. Um, thank you, Chief, for that. And I think this is an important question. Mike, thank you for um, that comment um, or, and question. I think what Chief is saying is important because I think systemic racism and, or, or policy issues or things that might be there may be, from, be viewed from different eyes, especially if we're an employer for, to the employee, to a person of color, to, um, you know, there's just different things that may affect. And I think what's, what's great about this space right now, we're looking at ways to connect with one another and be able to kind of solve some of the problems. And then uh, Chief, that's powerful that he says he may not recognize things, but please let him know so he can help his department. Um, next comment is from Shanna Howe. I put a comment, but I also have a question. Um, first okay. of all, I wanna, um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, 
I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Shanna Howell. I'm the Dean of the New Bedford campus for Bristol Community College. Um, I first of all want to thank all of the law enforcement officers and um, chiefs that are here because this is very brave of you um, to put yourself out there um, and to receive questions and comments, especially in the environment that we're currently living in. So um, kudos to all of you for taking this time to, um, to take these questions and these answers and be vulnerable in, in a sense. So I really appreciate that. Um, I also, also want to thank my colleague, um, Justin. Um, you really clarified something with me as far as the um, Army National Guard. Um, I really didn't know what their, their job was. Um, you know, a lot of times when you see them, um, it's for these, you know, these type of events if there's a, a quote unquote riot and, and they've been sent out for that. So it's kind of nice to know what their actual responsibilities are. Um, but my question can be posed to the um, law enforcement individuals that we have here. Um, as an African American woman who was raised in the South, though I was born in Boston, um, I was raised in the South. And a lot of my knowledge of police officers has always been negative. Um, um, when I think about learning the history for African Americans, especially in the South, um, we think about, um, you know, uh, doing the civil rights movement, you know, police dogs and um, being sprayed with water hose um, all the way into George Floyd and even, um, even more recent, more deaths. And um, how, what can law officers, police officers, departments do, or what would you recommend, or I really don't know how to phrase this question, but what can you do to change that, um, that idea that a lot of people, and I, I even think about my son, he's five years old, what he's going to learn is not going to be positive. I mean, the year that he and I was stuck at home all day, you know, we watched these videos and so forth, and I have to have a conversation with him. What can we do to change that culture that so many Blacks and African Americans and people of color have dealt with for so many years. Mr. Kirby talked about trauma. This is trauma, even though it may not have, you may not, a uh, person may not have dealt with it personally. They're watching it. They're young people watching this. What can we do to, to come together and change, change and rewrite history so that, you know, Blacks and African American and people of color won't continue to have that that stigma of that police officers are not good, people get scared. There's a video of a young man playing basketball who hid um, when a police officer was driving down the street because he didn't want him to see him, even though he was playing basketball in his yard. So what can we do to change that? And anybody can chime in, not just the police officers, but whomever might want to chime in. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me, Rob? Yes, we can. Uh, Ms. Howell, thank you for, for sharing that. And I have to echo your sentiments because um, my wife is an African-American uh, female and I have four kids, two girls and two boys. And my wife tells me every day uh, that I need to have the conversation, the talk with my son, uh, my nine-year-old son. And I'm going to almost tear up when I talk about this because it is somewhat painful hearing it from uh, that perspective. But I, I also tell her the things that I see every day when I go to work and I see guys, men and women who do not act like that, right? And I see a police department who is about discipline, right? I, I, I see those things, although I, I can't speak what, it, what it's like when, you know, Minneapolis, I can speak from what I see and I see discipline happening to officers who are out of line. But I have to also speak to my experiences, right? I also have to say that I could imagine, because it has happened to me, I pull over somebody and this is, the, the, this is my third encounter, let's say, because my first call was I went to a domestic violence call where I arrested a husband for abusing his wife. The second call that I go to is I, I go to a bad car accident. So now my mindset is, is, is in that, my, is it kind of in that warrior mindset because of things that I dealt with. So now I go over and, and I pull over a car for speeding. And the first thing that the guy says to me is that you pull me over because of my race, right? Oftentimes. I say, no, that's not why I'm pulling you over. I pulled you over because of what you did. But here goes the opposite side, is that now, because I've been in that seat before being pulled over, I thought it was because of my race. So I, I, I try to speak from both perspectives because oftentimes I, I'm living both perspectives. So the class that I created, Understanding Cultural Norms, speaks to those both perspectives. And I, I think that the way that we can solve this is people coming together who look like me and you, look like, you know, different people, and talking about our own experiences. Because if I tell an officer that I work with who is, is different from me, his race is different from me, if I tell him my perspective, he should be as equally upset as I am because I went through that, 
right? Because the world that we live in in policing, we're very close, we're very tight. He should be as equally upset. So because he's equally upset, now he understands what it's like to be that on that receiving end of somebody who was feel like they're mistreated, right? So the only way we're going to be able to, to bridge that is tough conversations like we're doing right now. And I have to be honest, I still haven't had that conversation, that, that talk with my son just yet, because uh, I, I'm, I just haven't had it just yet. My wife tells me I'm, I'm, I need to have it, but I haven't had it just yet. Look, can I, uh, I want to uh, kind of piggyback on something that he just said. Um, so I'll say this, I can't imagine how challenging and scary it must be to even have that kind of talk with your nine-year-old child. I mean, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I will also just kind of say this those interactions, those individual interactions with uh, community members, for, for the law enforcement officer on the side, that could have been the third or fourth interaction that they had for the day. But that's number one for that person in that day, right? It's like, I'm a, I'm a therapist, I'm in practice, I have four or five clients, and back to back to back, three of them curse me out, another one is hearing voices, I got to get an ambulance and get them taken out. And then my fifth one, I'm in a horrible mood. It's not their fault, right? So a part of this is like the work is so hard and so much, and that's why I always talk about like as service providers, we have to lead with humility and also kind of be checking in on our own stuff too. If I curse out my client because I had a bad interaction, two interactions before them, it is not their fault. And I think that is something that um, we need to, to focus on and even you mentioned um, warrior, like kind of going to that warrior mentality. For me, that's that trauma brain, because that's a lot of stuff for all of us to see. We have to normalize that. For me to sit through five sessions and hear all these horrific things, I'd be a damn fool if I said it didn't, it didn't bother me, it doesn't impact me. And if I don't, then I'm only going to be doing the service to the next person that I work with. So um, I just want to like throw that out there, because our, our individual, like I worked in child welfare. I would remove kids out of homes. And I know every time I did that, that kid or those children are going to remember every random detail about me, the glasses I was wearing, how I smelled, what color shirt I had on, because I had that same experience as a child. And I could, many, many years later, I can still describe the person that removed me from my family. So like, it's so important for us to check our own stuff when dealing with folks out here, right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. 100%. Rob, Rob, if I may. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with officers throughout the building and, and lately and about this particular topic. And, you know, perception is reality. It's the way I see it. And, um, you know, I, I've been telling some of the white officers that, you know, just because you may not think or you may not think like that or you may not, um, if you will, think that, that that type of racism exists um, doesn't mean that. Uh, they don't feel that way. And we need to recognize that we need to, uh, and it, the best way I think to do that is um, through, through what we're doing today, uh, just to echo my colleagues and, and also um, communication. You know, I'm asking officers to, whether it's a car stop, whether it's getting out of the car and interacting with the kids in the neighborhood, whether it's a, a barbecue, uh, we're going on a neighborhood association meeting to do better, a better job with communicating and having empathy for the way other people feel. Thank you. No, thank you guys. Thank you for that as well, Chief. And thank you, Kenton, and thank you, um, Demetrius, for um, that. Um, next question it came in privately, but it said question. It's uh, Serge. Hello, everyone. Um, my question is that Mr. Kirby brought up a good point about how throughout the course of your day, your interactions can at some point overwhelm you, right? And so to all the police officers in our leadership positions, how, uh, what methods can we put in place to support officers so that they aren't overwhelmed? Because um, I know I live in New Bedford and I don't know the exact statistics, but we're short on officers. So you have a lot of officers who are put in positions where there's forced overtime. And so you're constantly seeing um, troubling situations and you're not really getting the break that you need from it, right? And just like in my career as an educator, we can be a little overwhelmed. And so sometimes we need a break. So how do you find ways to support your officers so that they're not constantly um, like mentally overwhelmed? I, if I could speak to that, um, I think the biggest part for that is 
whoever that officer responds to for a supervisor, his or her sergeant, to recognize what's going on with that officer. And if you have to, if it's an, a, a situation where the officer is working too much, well, the officer goes home. If the situation where the officer did something wrong, the officer is disciplined. I think, and this is where I'm going to ha have the chief echo me here, police departments do a good job, I think, in disciplining their employees. But what doesn't happen is that oftentimes the communication doesn't get, artic doesn't get articulated to the public because it, ha it stays in-house. The officer gets disciplined, and, and, and that discipline doesn't go outside of the department, stays in-house. So I think, it, number one, sergeants being more uh, uh, watchful and then the discipline process, which does happen. Um, I don't know if you want to follow it up there, Chief. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, it's not something that, um, you know, traditionally that we've, we've shared outside the organization. And um, I'm not sure if we're going to quite get to the point where we share all the details, but um, I, I agree with the sergeant. Um, we, we, uh, it's very common for officers to be disciplined from anything from, um, you know, dis talking disrespectful to someone to, to, uh, to a cruiser accident. Um, you know, they, they, the officers need to be held accountable, but just to the, uh, to the issue of perhaps an officer losing their temper or, uh, needing, needing a break. Um, I think we're coming a long way with that. Uh, when I came on the job, uh, 30 years ago, um, there was that, more of that blue wall of silence where I'm not going to talk about a guy who may be in crisis because I don't want him to be pulled off the street or have that stigma. Uh, as a chief, I can tell you that it's not uncommon now for officers to come to me and say, um, you know, uh, officer uh, Jones went to a uh, extremely difficult call, whether it was a, a car accident involving a baby and, and, and we're not what we do here. Um, and I'm not sure if they do that in Fitchburg, but we, we actually, I actually cut what's called an order and they're ordered to go to um, the employee assistance program. And it's some of the feedback, it's confidential, but some of the feedback I get is they, that they go, they go to the program reluctantly. And um, at some point they end up embracing it and they start talking about a lot of different issues, whether it's in their professional career or it's in their personal career. So I think we, we've come a long way with that. And I, but having said that, I still think this, some, some, you know, uh, some roads that we need to go down to, to improve that in that area. But yes, it's very common for officers to be disciplined. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a, one of our students as well. TJ, you have a, a comment? Hi, yeah. Um, I just wanted to just sort of take a second as, you know, sort of a, a third party in this listening to the police side, um, you know, I, as a, as a black male, I have, I appreciate the, the, the effort that's being put in on their side to try to sort of redo this, what it, what really is trauma, because I, even though like I, I could leave this meeting today knowing that, you know, police are taking progressive steps to try to, you know, get rid of this problem, but you know, if I go, when I go walk to my studio, which is half a mile from my house right now, and I, if I see a cop <laughs> driving by me, it's still going to be that same, like, pitted stomach in my feeling, like, just praying to God that nothing happens. So, um, and I, I think it definitely takes worth work from both sides because I know people who have interactions with police and just act completely out of line and then act surprised when their sort of disrespect is met with the same type of energy. Um, so I think it, you know, it definitely takes work from both sides. And, um, you know, I, I'm definitely spreading, uh, doing what I can to communicate with my, with my friends and other people my age that, you know, that it's not really, this really isn't a competition where it's not gonna, we're not really going to get anywhere from, you know, continuing this stigma of this negative stigma around the police like we need to heal and and bond to really move forward but it takes both sides so i just wanted to say thank you and just and notice just say that i noticed it rob if i can just quickly yeah, um, sure. it's awesome what I, I absolutely love what you just said um, you know, we, I, to me, it comes down to communication and interactions. We need to have more positive interactions. 
with, uh, you know, the, uh, a diverse people. And, and that's the only way we're going to build trust is by having some positive interactions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, next question is from Megan, another one of our students, Megan Holden, who just graduated. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, yes. Perfect. <laughs> uh, first off, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out and putting this together and being involved in this. Thank you to Multicultural Center. Thank you to Bristol. Um, this is very important conversations. I feel like that's need to be need to be done. Um, some things I have questions about is just about how police, I guess, how it's going about the business uh, as usual. One thing, a couple things. One is community. I feel like one of the biggest things is when when people see police, they kind of feel like they're in trouble. Um, they get tension in there instead of you know being involved in the community. I remember growing up, they had things as PAO. Um, I know that some things have, because of funding, has not been around anymore. Um, but I was wondering if there's one question I have is, what are you guys um, doing to get more involved in the community instead of just showing up, you know, when you're called? Um, and I know you guys are busy too, but maybe how, I guess you can work around that or maybe how some things you can put in place. Also, I heard some things, um, I, was, when I, was, I was watching interviews and I was researching. Um, so one thing that, stuck out to me was quotas. I don't really understand um, why that's a thing. Um, one interview I watched was saying that, you know, they have quotas, you know, to fill, to fill the beds and they target certain communities. And I know forever, I remember I read a Hill News um, article that said we had quotas for, I think was it traffic stops or some type of, you know, speed and tickets, something like that. Um, so I just want to question like, what's the purpose of quotas? Why do we need them? And it, is it a problem? Um, and lastly, um, guns and training. So one thing I want to point out that um, I understand cops have a difficult job and it, it can be a scary job. But I also think it's important for people to know that cops are supposed to be trained to deal with civilians. Civilians are not trained to deal with cops. So I wanted to know, like, one, if we, you mentioned something about cops, we're not kind of banning shooting at vehicles. Can we get something that Maybe, I'm not sure if there's something in place already, maybe you can tell me, um, from guns being pulled out on people who are not armed um, altogether. And so I think that can stop a lot of shootings and also do something, because I think there's also not only a problem of police brutality, but also a problem of accountability. Um, a lot of police officers that we, we see in these cases and they get off. So what can we do to make sure they're held accountable? And um, maybe whether it's a bit training, um, psych valves or like if where's this justice can you please um set some light on that thank you i know it was a lot i'm sorry yeah <laughs> <laughs> everybody wants to kind of jump in uh, i'll mention rob uh you know uh, um as far as uh having a firearm out when when they don't need to uh, i think that probably um can be addressed with better de-escalation training um you know, where, where officers um, feel more comfortable. I, I, I'm going to be, I have to be honest, and I'm, I'm confident in saying that some police academies, I don't control the police academies, and I don't control the training. That's outside of my purview. And There, there may be some tr training scenarios or a particular person who's training an officer and kind of instill that, that warrior mindset, if you will. So um, once I can get my hands on the officers here, if you will, then, 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 uh, uh, not talking about de-escalation and, and doing things in a, in a, in a different way. Um, one of the things I want to bring back in the fall that we had for a while is the Teen Police Academy. Um, we're going to run some, some kids through that, the high school age kids, so they get a little sense of, of uh, do they want to go into this career? What's this career all about? So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, but I'll, I'll defer to some of my colleagues to, uh, to talk about uh, what they're doing. I think... Um, and again, I, I, I try not to speak directly from my department because, um, you know, I think that'd be very unfair for me to do that. But what I do see is a lot of departments have their own community engagement unit, right? Because for an officer who works his or her eight, eight hour shift, they're responding to calls, they're doing X, Y, and Z. But oftentimes it's those small, those small encounters that you really can build that community policing to an extent. 
Um, but for busy, busier departments, it's hard to do that. So that's why these departments have their own community engagement unit who specifically goes out there and engages the community uh, for different type of events. Um, but I know for myself, when I was an officer responding to calls working 11 to 7, I would do everything I can to engage the community, even at 3.30 in the morning when I'm at someone else for a domestic violence call. It's those small interactions that I think really do help. But again, that's the guardian mindset that the chief was talking about, when you can engage the community and do those type of things. So I think as officers, we need to do more of those type of things with the public. Um, and I like what you said, uh, officers are trained to deal with the public, but the public is not trained to deal with officers. I like that. I, I, I think that was powerful. And I think for me, that's going to be a shift in my mentality, my thinking, when I engage um, you know, my, uh, my community members. I like that. Thank you for pointing that out. Appreciate it. Thank you. So the next question we have here, um, what are your recommendations for academic preparation of tomorrow's criminal justice professionals as we educate them at Bristol? I don't want to dominate the mic here, but yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I think more of what we're talking about, community policing and understanding the community that you police in. So I'm going to share a quick example with you. Um, I graduated the academy um, as, as my class president of the academy. And one day an instructor came in. He's a sergeant and, uh, and Lynn, Lynn PD. We know Lynn's a, Lynn's a pretty busy uh, place. And he threw out a question. He said, class, I just responded to a call last night because he was still on a job as well. And he said, I went to a call and it was a Hispanic lady. And the lady said uh, she couldn't, he couldn't handle her problem because he was a white officer. He says, you don't know about what, it, you don't know, you, you don't know about me. You can't handle my problem. So he throws a question out to the class and he says, class, are we getting into a point where you're going to press one, if you call the police, you're going to press one for an Hispanic officer, two for a black officer, three for a white officer, four for an Asian officer. He's like, are we getting to this point? And for my law enforcement colleagues in here, you know, when you're in academy, you don't want to say anything. You want to be quiet because you just want to get through the academy day. You want to, you want to go home. You want to be quiet. So I didn't say anything. He looks at me, he said, Mr. President, what do you think? So, oh man, now I got to say something, right? So I said, okay, this is what it is. I think your community needs to be representative. I think your police department needs to be representative of your community. I think that that, that was an honest statement that she said. However, I don't think it takes a white officer, only a white officer to solve a white problem. I think, again, you have to be more multicultural in your approach and more understanding, which is why we're doing what we're doing today. But then the only other uh, black officer in the uh, student officer in the class said, Mr. President, you're wrong. What needs to happen is officers need to understand the community that they police, right? So it doesn't take a black person to solve a black person, a bl black person problem, but it could take, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. You just have to understand the community that you police. So it takes police officers getting out of their cruiser, interacting with the community and having those real meaningful dialogues that really create change, being transformational in your approach. Not just, hey, how you doing, but more getting to know the people that you're around. I think that's the only way we're going to be able to solve this. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that's, you know, more of that comes from the new curriculums that are coming out for policing. And then uh, I would like to just add kind of even like, I mean, I'm not in the academy. I'm, I'm not a cop. Clearly, I'm a, I'm a social worker therapist. I like, you know, I'm important all about stuff. feelings. And important stuff. stuff. It's all important stuff. I'm all about the feelings and everything. But I'm really <laughs> big on like, things like language, right? Um, and reframing them. So I look at, I always say so, to folks, I don't do anger management classes. I do emotion regulation classes because anger is a normal emotion. It's just when there's too much of it, then it's problematic. Just like there's too much sadness, that's problematic. So like de-escalation is not necessarily, we are already kind of coming in with this frame of like, this person is going to be a problem, so I have to bring them down. How about effective communication with people, right? So you, if you have folks that are coming into the academy that are like, you know, fresh and learning, if we're kind of framing this in the lens of how to effectively communicate with your community, it's not looking as, it, it kind of also kind of knocks down some of that warrior mentality that you guys have been talking about, right? If a guardian, it's like, if your guardian, it's like, oh, how do I effectively communicate with folks? Oh yeah, sometimes they're highs and they're lows, right? It's like, it's, a, it's just a reframing. And I think those, that stuff goes such a long way. Absolutely. 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 Thank you guys for that as well. Um, we're going to get into a couple more minutes and we're going to get into the next steps and actions. This is a great conversation. I just want people to know that's in this, that this is not 
today is we're going to get some tactics. We're going to hear some great points. And then we're, there'll be a part two. We'll continue this conversation and, and give you know, the public a little bit more input on what we're doing. We'll have other professionals uh, to be part of it as well. Um, hopefully I get to every question because there's only seem to be a few more in here. I got a couple private uh, messages and then we'll, we'll kind of get it going. Um, I'm, Mimi, I'm going to skip yours for a quick second because I want um, to give uh, Bristol Police an opportunity to speak and then I'm going to come right back to yours um, in a second here. So, um, and so the question was from Doreen, I believe, right? And I'm sorry, I'm trying to balance three different so screens. I'll ask the question. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so we don't have campus police regularly on the Attleboro and Tawan campuses, and it would really be an advantage for the students to have an opportunity to build rela relationships with the campus police. Is there a plan to have a larger role of the campus police on our campuses? Uh, thanks, Doreen. Let me uh, let me address that in two parts. Um, as far as uh, more contact, not necessarily physical contact, once we do have our uh, social media sites up and running, we will have more contact and uh, communication with all of our students, faculty, and staff. To answer what I believe is another part of your question, the physical presence on those campuses, uh, we do the best uh, that we can. Um, with our, with our staffing, um, we try to get uh, officers up there on a daily basis to both of those campuses to at least uh, stop in and, and uh, check in with the staff, the students, take a look around and uh, field any questions or concerns and to try and stay in contact with them. Um, it's not ideal, but we do the best with what we've got right now. I appreciate that. I just want to make a, one comment that I really appreciated your fundraiser for breast cancer. I was going through breast cancer treatments right at the time that you did that, and I was presented with one of the t-shirts from the campus police, and I wore it to each of my surgeries and, and during my, my treatments. So thank you. Well, don't mention it. Glad to see you doing better. I am doing great. Thank All you. All right. Awesome. I'm glad you're doing so much better, Doreen. Thank you for your, your comment and question there. Um, so next question is for Demetrius, a question for Demetrius. Um, what are the most important points that you would make to Bristol's criminal justice students in the wake of the George Floyd tragedy? Wow. Um, um, tough question. I think it goes back to I, it's going to sound like a, a funny quote, but I'm going to quote uh, John F. Kennedy. That's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, right? So if you think there's a problem in policing, which let's be, there, there is a problem. If you think there's a problem, then come along and, and join the job and change it from the inside, right? Uh, have your perspective be that perspective that leads to change. Don't sit quietly on the sideline complaining about the problem. If you're going to be in the field, let's do something about the problem, right? I think that's, the, that, that, that's my overall statement that wear the uniform and hold the people that you work with accountable. And if you want to create change, lead, lead by doing that, right? And stay away from uh, the, the media comments because oftentimes we know the media only tells us a small part of what's going on. They show that small clip and that small clip makes us all upset, but they don't tell you what leads up to the clip, right? Now, and, I, and I, I hate to say that, but that's really what happens to why we're so divisive at times, because we listen to just one side, whether it be the Republican side or the Democratic side. We just listen to those one side, and we don't really see the true issue that's happening. So let's be honest, and let's look at the entire situation, not just little snippets of, of the issue. And if that's the way you feel, let's change it from the inside. Join the police department and, we, and let's change it. Rob? Yes. Uh, I just want to say, Dimitri, so uh, bravo. I, I absolutely love it. And that's the message, one of the primary messages that I wanted to send um, through the recruiting unit when they have the opportunity to meet with some of, the, some of our young adults. And, 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 and Rob, if I may, I, I saw a couple people about the quota question they wanted a kind of a follow-up for it I, I i just forgot to answer it my apologies but um 
uh, we don't we don't have a quota. I'm 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 a little perplexed. Um, I'm using going back in my memory to think of a time if we ever did, and I think the only time that um, we required officers to come in with a certain amount of of traffic tickets was many years ago when we have uh, what's called the Avenue here in Fall River, and we had a lot of uh, complaints of of racing uh, motorcycles and cars, and officers were hired on an overtime basis. And um, one of the things I think happened when well, you had some officers come in with no tickets um, on, on an overtime, uh, overtime basis, which was a problem. And I think, I think that if I recall correctly, I think there might've been, you know, like a, a four hour or ticket minimum, but we, other than that, um, and that was quite a long time ago, other than that, um, we've never had that I'm aware of or familiar with any type of quota related to, to any, um, any, uh, um, you know, any, any issue with traffic tickets or arrests or, or field stops has never been any type of requirement in my, my career. No, thank you thank for you. that, Chief. And I think that's very important as we talk about transparency and we move forward. I think getting that information out to the public because if the public assumes that there's a quota, I've always thought there was one. And then I'm sure others are thinking that. And then that's something that is a barrier that we may already think that, you know, you're just trying to harass me for no reason. So maybe uh, our transparency, as we talk about our next tactics in a minute, I just want to get to one more question. Um, but as we get to that, that might be a solution to kind of put out there to the public that Fall River Police, you know, Bristol Police, and where, wherever we are working, don't have those types of things. Um, and it's being proactive and saying that, even they're not asking for it, but it might be something that they're thinking. So that's um, a great question, um, certainly. I have one question. I think this, is, this one is going to be pretty powerful. So, and we'll leave it as this is the last question for this, for this, um, for this forum. Um, so the question here says uh, to the officers and everyone on the panel, um, thoughts about unions sometimes handcuffing um, the city or county um, taking appropriate actions um, with their departments and moving forward. Rob, I'll, if I may, I'll make it really quick because I know you know yeah. you want to get the other, the other, my other peers. Um, um, I just had an interview today with, with a Herald News reporter, and that was her first question, um, you know, because we, we talked about the pilot program for the body-worn cameras, and, and uh, she, you know, she expected me to say that um, we have two unions here. We have the, uh, the officers and we have the superior officers. She expected me to say that, that, that the answer was no, a flat-out no, and we have to negotiate that because it's a change of working conditions. I'm happy to report that uh, the feedback that I'm getting from both the leaders of those unions and, and their, their bodies, if you will, is they want to listen. Um, they recognize that there are some issues. They want to sit down and they want to talk. So um, I'm really, I'm really pleased with that. I, you know, I, I can't, I don't want to speak for any other communities, but um, so far, fingers crossed, hopefully it stays that way. Um, there's a good rapport going between myself and, and the both unions. Uh, Rob, if I, I'm not, I've never been a, a big union person, you know, so I, I can't really speak to what the union does, but, um, you know, looking at it from an objective point of view, um, unions are, you know, they they protect their workers in, in an extent, right? So there's something going on that is, you know, maybe harmful to the, to, to the, to the patch or badge you wear, then the union should step up and say something, right? But I, I can't really, you know, speak to a, a, a specific situation where I think the union, you know, put handcuffs on, on a situation. Cause I haven't really observed that. Um, so I really can't speak to that specifically yet. Pretty sure I will over my career, but I haven't, I, I can't speak to it now. Yeah. Well, no, thank you for that. Um, anybody, so as we um, close here, does any of the panelists before I finish up with the last slides here, would like anything to add anything or say anything or comment or anything? I just want to thank go back to. Sorry, my point. No, I'm sorry, Chief. Go ahead, Chief. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for having this. Uh, I think it's a great thing, and and uh, I'd like to stay involved and get more officers involved as well. Thank you. Thank you. I just think the biggest thing is for that question about you know my my advice to the uh, to uh, BC uh, to Bristol what they can do for the students and CJ. I think you got to join the conversation. Right. If you think that that you've been that something has happened to you or you feel like police should do something differently, then you got to wear the uniform. You, you, you have to do it. And and, and when you once you do it, then try to change it from from that perspective and really see what happens day in and day out with the policing in your community. Because, again, oftentimes you only get a small uh, snippet about what happens. We don't get the full story. So get to be part of the conversation. Yeah, and I, I just like to say, uh, you know, 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Rob, for uh, facilitating. As usual, great job. Thanks to the offices, uh, great insights, and um, and to the uh, to, to the other people that made comments, uh, Megan and TJ and Shanna. Um, yeah, all great, uh, all great uh, points. Thanks a lot. Absolutely, thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, by the way, Rob, for having me be here. I know I'm the outsider from New York, um, but uh, what I would like to say is when thinking around kind of getting involved in criminal justice, uh, it doesn't always just have to be working in law enforcement. There's a whole field around criminal justice reform and advocacy uh, because, um, and, and that, that, that's a space too. Um, there's a lot of uh, organizations nationally doing really great organizing around um, looking at the criminal justice system and trying to figure out how to best um, reform it. So like I know one, for example, Just Leadership USA, uh, they, are, they do a lot of national advocacy work specifically around uh, the criminal justice uh, field and actually use and, and turn to a lot of folks who have their own lived experiences within the criminal justice system to inform um, their lobbying and advocacy work. So uh, they're based out of here in New York City, but they do work nationally, have staff all over the country. So it's justleadershipusa.org, I believe. Good, 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 good. I just want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, the panelists and um, the participants as well. Um, I look forward to future forums of this nature. And uh, to be honest with you, I look forward to when we can get together face to face. Uh, the video is good. Uh, we, you know, we get to meet people from all over the place, but uh, I prefer face to face. But uh, uh, it was it was great meeting uh, all of you. And um, I I want to uh, just point out. Uh, if I could go back a little bit to the young man, TJ, um, I think he really hit the nail on the head. He seems to be, he seems to have the philosophy that we all need, no matter what side you're on, law enforcement or the general public, you have to be open-minded to other people's thoughts and feelings and emotions. Um, that really resonated with me. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, it was great meeting you all. Um, even the Yankees fan, I guess. You know. <laughs> 27 <laughs> rings, baby. 27 <laughs> rings. <laughs> Remember 2004. That's all I'm going to say. I don't know what you're talking about, huh? huh? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And Rob, Melissa, thank you very much. Great job, Rob, Melissa. Awesome job. Thank you. Baxter, do um, you have anything? Or? Yes, I just wanted um, – to say um, that this was excellent and this is step one. Um, this is what's going to uh, create a uh, stronger future uh, for everyone. And um, I'm just happy to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Uh, Melissa, you would mind putting up the last slide? Thank you so much guys as well. I'm gonna, I'll say my thank yous in a second here. I just want to kind of get through this stuff so I can let everybody and start enjoying their, some people are off tomorrow so they can start enjoying their weekend, um, their long weekend. Um, so again, as we do these programs and we're, this is, again, this is the beginning phase of this, um, of this particular section, which is race policing um, and criminal justice, okay? And we always want to come up with actionable items. So if you're an educator, um, a student, um, wherever, you know, wherever you may lay uh, within, the, 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 within this box that we're creating right now through the social justice, we want to try to, one thing we've always talked about is impacting our circles, no matter where it is, whether it's just your parents, whether it's your, 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 your significant other, or whether it's, you know, your work area, however you can influence, we want to create those changes. So what have I done over the last since our last meeting, I've been meeting with, like I said earlier, with a ton of professionals that have that can really impact change um, and really can do things. And, and as we see today, we have um, our panel who came today to have conversation with us and really um, and, and they show what they are doing. Um, they, they express their feelings and they also showed us what their departments are, are what they're looking to do in the future moving um, moving forward. And that's how I felt I was able to influence change because I don't have that autonomy or power, but I know that some of the panelists do and other individuals who I'm speaking to in the future or currently or in the future may have that uh, um, as well. Um, so again, what can, we, what can you do? 
So beware of your own implicit biases and racial profiling is something that we've we talked about in the last um, panel uh, as well. So just be aware of things that we have. We all have biases, people, all right? So just make sure we have an understanding that they're there. Sometimes you may not even realize that, that they even exist, okay? Make sure your response to a situation is based on a situation and not uh, a bias that you may have against the, in, the actual individual. And that's things that our police departments, our education departments, our teachers, our you know, family members, everybody can uh, use that for themselves. Continue the conversation is very, very important. What happened today shouldn't just end. What I'm very, you know, I heard that there was a little bit of an issue with, um, with uh, our outlook today. So some people um, had problems getting in, but we had a, as high as 97 people for today's, um, but we had 143 people RSVP. So you never know if some people RSVP and things happen. However, the, con the conversation continued because people decided that they didn't think that the last one was the end all. They went to the second phase because they wanted to see what we're doing moving forward. So it's my responsibility to keep this conversation and create these spaces. I'm, I'll get to what we're doing in the future in a second, but this is extremely positive that we have this many people that care about our community and that are volunteering their time to, to make a change or to hear what we can do in order to create this change. So, and also educate yourself, okay? Know as you're educating yourself, and educate your personal circles, do those things. Um, if you're a part of our newsletter, if you're signed up for this, you get our newsletter. If today's the first time you've been in a, one of our social justice forums, um, you didn't get a newsletter, you will get a newsletter with a, our past newsletter. So you're gonna get the books, the readings, the videos, the things that you can help to influence those areas. Teach yourselves, Think, you'll see things that we've done, that I've done over the last couple of weeks. You'll see things that others have done in the in the history of America that may, that may not know. There's also video links that you may not be aware of, like one that we included was at the 13th Amendment, because some people, um, the 13th, which some people don't understand the importance uh, or the impact of the 13th Amendment and how that has um, impacted uh, Black and African American men and women over the years. Um, supporting uh, ending poli um, policies that, and laws that promote discrimination and racial inequality is very, very important. We talk, of, we want people to create change. So we look at, you know, as you heard these professionals today, they, they're on our side. They want great things to happen. However, we sometimes, where we can influence, we don't, we don't do it. We just hope that it happens. It's just not, you can't hope. You have to take action, okay? And that's why these are actual items. So um, all police officers must enforce the law. We know that there's laws that are there that they have to enforce. If you do not like the laws, this is where we come in as members of society to vote against laws, to you know, argue against policies that may affect others that, because they are just the messenger. Same thing as Justin said about the military. They, you know, if anyone remembers that scene, okay, and again, I stand, try to stand in the middle, but if everybody remembers that scene when the military removed all the peaceful protesters, it had, we all had an eerie feeling. Well, at least I did. I don't, and I'm pretty sure everyone in here probably did as well. That's them enforcing the actual policy or law that our president took at that moment, okay? Um, and, and I think that really got people scared and people started talking about martial law and not really understanding that martial law, we can't, martial law is not, our military can't um, invoke martial law, a, a different military would come in and, and, you know, so there's so many different pieces that we don't know as, as, this, as the public, general public, so let's educate ourselves on that. Let's make sure we're voting against certain laws and things that, that we can affect our day to day. Uh, next slide, please, Melissa. So where do we stand now? So today is a check mark, as you can see, of poli uh, policing, criminal justice, and race, okay, a part of our forms. The next one is gonna be race and educational um, inequity. We're gonna have individuals from all over, um, from all of the education spectrum to speak. Early intervention is gonna be important. So we're gonna talk about early intervention when students are just going into elementary school. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna have um, teachers that are work with special education speak as well. As, as, and we also have individuals from maybe uh, early grades K through five speak on, on their perspective. We are a community college. So all these things are important as building, as we build this uh, social justice um, pathway. Next, we'll have middle school um, 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 teachers speak as well, and some of the experience of the students. 
Uh, we will also will have high school vocational and, um, and non-vocational educators speak. And we will have educators and professors from um, higher learning, higher education components speak about the experiences of race and education equity. Um, that's gonna be a very, very powerful, powerful, powerful um, step one for what we're doing here. And it will tie into the last two um, forms that we had. Uh, next slide, Melissa. And then so uh, in closing, if you guys, if you need to contact myself or Melissa, our email is here. Tomorrow you will receive, um, um, tomorrow you will receive an email from us that will, uh, will have a newsletter for you. It'll have tactics. It'll have this PowerPoint will be attached to it. It'll have opportunities for you. Um, again, the information for um, that people that are on the panels will have their emails if you want to contact them. If you have a quick question, I'm sure um, they are willing to, you know, say, you know, get back to us and, and make sure that, you know, that they're part of this build. This is not just it for them, as we've been speaking. They are all, they're all in. Just like I hope that you guys that are um, taking part of the social justice um, forums are all in as well as we try to create a better community. Um, my role at uh, Bristol Community College and Director of Multicultural Affairs, where I'm looking to engage the community. That's the only way we're gonna engage, engage our community so that way our students from various identities and backgrounds feel comfortable coming to Bristol, understanding they're gonna get a great education. They have great people here who cares about them. We wanna make sure that they understand that. And then the communities that they serve, because when they leave Bristol, they're walking and to understand that there's a chief of police um, in these different communities in Bristol County that care about them, that really understand that there needs to be change. Imagine how great the synergy can be between ourselves and our local community. This is very, very important. People that are outside of Bristol County and Community College, and this is these. Hopefully, we're able. This is not. We don't have all the answers, but hopefully, this is a template to start creating this in your own areas as we as we uh, continue to fight against um, social justice and making sure that everyone is accepted and um, everyone is accepted and everyone is living the life that they need to live, uh, a mm -hmm. good one, hopefully, right? And that's what we're trying to create. Um, and then last, I'd like to thank uh, Melissa Rogers, who keeps me in order because I have 100 million things that I'm, I'm doing. So she keeps me organized. So I appreciate that. I want to thank the panelists um, for your time today. Um, and let's uh, keep this moving. Our next one is July 30th. I hope to see everyone there. Our advertisements will start on July 15th. Um, so you'll start seeing the advertisements for the next one. Our college communications department is helping with that, um, create that now. And so again, I thank you. I'm proud of everybody that's being part of this. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for being with us and we'll connect soon. Thank you guys. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Rob. Thank nice to meet everybody. everybody. Have a great July 4th weekend. Yep, everyone enjoy the everybody. weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy. Yes. Happy 4th. Happy 4th. No more fireworks, please. Yeah, please. Please do it. It's terrible here in New York. Oh my God. Of course it is. You don't have a decent baseball team down there. 27 rings, man. <laughs> Take care, you guys. Have a good one. Be well, everybody. Yeah.